Well, thank you very much indeed. And, and uh, good morning or good evening or good afternoon to you all, depending on where you've logged in from. Um, I must say, when I gave my first webinar talk to the Western Front Association last July, I didn't for a moment think that we'd still be doing it in March uh, 2021. But uh, we'll get there. We've just got to, as Churchill said, keep buggering on. Um, I'm told that I might be able to get a haircut sometime in April. So please forgive my rather uh, shaggy uh, appearance at the moment. The Great War, the Kaiser's War, the First World War, whatever you want to call it, it's probably more deeply embedded in the psyche of this nation than any other aspect of our long military history. And I think the, the public view, not the view of members of the Western Front Association, who I think know better, but much of the public still believe that the British army took the youth of this nation and of the empire and threw it away in an unnecessary war mismanaged by butchers and bunglers that cost us a whole generation uh, dead for no real purpose. And I think if you went out into the streets of any of our great cities and you stopped somebody and said, tell me about the First World War, um, if you weren't carted away by men in white socks, you'd hear uh, fairly vociferous criticism, uh, talk of futility and mud and, and stupidity. So what I'd like to do uh, in this talk, if I may, is have a look at these popular views and say to ourselves, does the evidence support the view? And if the evidence doesn't support the view, then why do we believe it? And I think that um, there are a number of points that we always have to make uh, before we consider anything to do <clears throat> with the British Army uh, in the First World War. Uh, and first of all, this was a coalition war. And Britain was the junior partner, at least on land. At sea, of course, it was a different matter. Now, it's often been said, it was said at the time, it's been said since, that the British expeditionary force that left these shores and went across to France and Belgium <clears throat> in August 1914 was the best trained, the best equipped, the best led body of troops ever to leave these shores. And I think that is probably correct. But it was pitifully small. Four infantry divisions, one cavalry division, compared to 62 French infantry divisions and 10 cavalry divisions. And even at the end of the war, in 1918, when there were 61 divisions in the British Expeditionary Force, 51 of them British and 10 of them Empire divisions, uh, the French still had well over 200 divisions. And all that is also, of course, reflected in the length of front that was held by the British Expeditionary Force compared to the length of front held by the French. And that meant that it was not up to British generals or British politicians to decide the course of the war on the Western Front. Those decisions were very largely made by the French. Now, if we only look at what Britain did on the Western Front, some of the things we did don't make sense. You think, well, why do, why do we do that? But if you zoom out and look at the Western Front as a whole or the war as a whole, then some of these things start to make sense. You can really only understand the Somme campaign if you know what's happening at Verdun, 120 miles down to the south. You can really only understand why the Third Battle of Ypres, Passion Day as it's sometimes called, uh, had to go on if you know what's happening uh, to the French army. And if you look at it that way, then a lot of these things make sense. This was a unique war. It's the only time in modern British history when the whole of the British army, or most of the British army, uh, were fighting the main enemy, Germany, in the main theater, which was the Western Front. Didn't happen before. I mean, after all, up until 1914, when people talked about the Great War, they meant the Napoleonic Wars. And during the Napoleonic Wars, we were very careful not to fight the main enemy, France, in the main theater, uh, Europe. Um, and the Second World War, the British Army gets kicked out of Europe via Dunkirk and Cherbourg in 1940. It sits around in England, twiddling its thumbs and doing bug and all until it comes 
back again in 1944. Now, I agree that saying sitting around twiddling thumbs and doing bugger all is unfair to those fighting in North Africa with the partisans in the Balkans and Greece and Crete and, of course, in the Far East. But in terms of winning the war, in terms of beating the main enemy, Germany, uh, it really didn't achieve very much. Yes, it told people that Britain was still in the war. Britain wasn't going to surrender. Uh, and this gave great comfort to the occupied countries um, and, of course, to the, in the initial stages, the only neutral country that mattered, which was the United States. But it wasn't fighting the main enemy in the main war. So, so this war, the First World War, is unique. People say it was an unnecessary war. Well, let's just think about that. Why did Britain go to war in 1914? Well, there were a whole lot of factors, but the two main factors were, first of all, the guarantee to Belgium. <clears throat> when Belgium had broken away from the Netherlands in the 1830s, they were encouraged to do so by Britain, and their territorial integrity was guaranteed by Britain, France, and Prussia. Why did the British guarantee its, its um, integrity? Because the British wanted a friendly nation on the Rhine and Shell Delta, because that's how Britain gets in and out uh, of, the, of the continent, out, in and out of Europe. So when Germany breaches that neutrality in 1914, Britain is morally obliged uh, to go to war. Uh, but of course, there was another much more practical reason. And that is that between 1907 and 1914, Germany launched no fewer than 17 battleships. Now, why does Germany want a blue water navy? I mean, they haven't got an empire. They've got a few colonies, parts of, in the Pacific and, and bits of Africa nobody else wanted, and a few concessions in China, but they haven't got an empire. Um, they do have overseas trade, uh, so they're entitled to a navy to defend it, but why? they don't need a navy of that size. The only reason Germany can need a Blue Water Navy is to take on the Royal Navy at some stage in the future. And if Britain had not gone to war with France in 1914, I think it is reasonable to say that the Germans would almost certainly have won. And if with the whole resources of the whole of Europe at their back, if they did then take on the British, it's a war that the British might not have been able to win. <clears throat> so this was a, a necessary war and it was a unique war. Let's take some of these uh, beliefs uh, that everybody uh, thinks uh, are the facts, and I suppose one of the most uh, popular one is that we lost a whole generation killed in the First World War. Well, what are the facts? Well, the facts are that both in absolute numbers and in percentage of the population, and the percentage of men enlisted, the British lost less than the main ally, France, or the main enemy, Germany. British losses in Normandy in 1944 were worse than those on the Somme. Now that may sound ridiculous, but I'll come back to that uh, in a few minutes. Now, when I challenged the belief that uh, we lost a generation, of course, um, it, we did lose an awful lot of people killed, over 700,000. But just look at these figures, and I don't want to blind you with viewfoils, but look at the figures for France. The French have a population which is 7 million less than the population of the United Kingdom, and yet <coughs> they have almost twice, they, they mobilise more men, they have twice as many military deaths, 16, just over 16% of all the men mobilized in the French army are killed. And the British, it's, it's just over 8%. And it's worse than that because the French population was an aging population. So the proportion of men of military age were a much smaller percentage of the population than the they were in the British population because the British population then was a, a young population. So the effect, not only did the French have twice as many military deaths, uh, but of course the effects were much, much worse. Um, nevertheless, 700,000 uh, dead British troops, um, and that's not counting the empire, that's just the United Kingdom, uh, that is a, a heck of a lot. Um, but, <clears throat> 
In the United Kingdom, we have a census every 10 years. We got another one coming up this year. We had one in 1901, one in 1911, one in 1921, one in 1931. Now, this uh, diagram, I drew it, so it's pretty scruffy, and I apologize for that. The red line at the top is the total population of the United Kingdom. And the green line at the bottom is the male population of military age, which I take to be 19 to 34. <clears throat> now, I say 19 because the law said that you had to be 19 before you could go abroad. That's 18 now, it was then, it was 19. Now, if, yes, of course, there were people who fiddled their age, uh, claimed to be 19 when they weren't and went abroad. But act, and although we hear an awful lot about these chaps, they were actually a tiny minority uh, of the men who served. Uh, 34, yes, of course, there were people well over the age of 34 who were killed, but again, a minority. So essentially, the deaths occur between the male population of 19 to 34. Now, if you look at the red line, and indeed look at both lines, if you um, suddenly arrived um, in the United Kingdom from outer space, and the only statistics you were given were the population statistics and looking at them, uh, you might be forgiven for failing to spot that between the 1911 census and the 1921 census, um, we suffered the greatest bloodletting uh, ever in, in military terms, because the overall population continues to go up slightly less steeply than before, <clears throat> and the population of men of military age stays pretty much the same. Now, of course, there's immigration, there's emigration, there are all sorts of other factors. Uh, but the point I'm making is that demographically, it does not appear to make a huge amount of difference. Now, of course, it's different if you happen to be one of them that was killed, or if you're a relative of one of them, if you're the mother of one of them, or the father of one, or whatever. But overall, demographically, it does not make a huge amount of difference. Surprisingly, perhaps. Um, Macmillan said that um, all his all his friends uh, were killed on the Somme. Well, he can't have many friends because 74% of all the men who went into the Somme from July right through to November, 74% of them came out uh, without a scratch. And one, one gets these sort of family legends. Um, there was a lovely old lady in our village um, who always wore black uh, and lived alone. And as small boys, uh, we would be occasionally taken to see her and she'd, she'd give us sweets or biscuits. And she was highly respected um, in the village. And all her boyfriends had been killed in the First World War. And that's why she'd never married. And many years later, uh, when she was long dead, uh, and I was talking to her I think great nephew he was. And I remember saying, you know, great shame that your great aunt Elizabeth um, never got married. She'd have been a wonderful mother. She was terribly good to us little boys. Um, what a shame all her boyfriends were killed in the First World War. And her great nephew was then, I think, getting on for 90, said, who told you all her boyfriends were killed in the First World War? And I said, well, I don't know, that's that's what we were always led to believe. He said absolute nonsense. He said the reason my great aunt Elizabeth never got married was because she was damned ugly. So, you know, <laughs> anecdotal evidence or family legend isn't always isn't always true. Um, if we um, if we have a look uh, at those figures, those seven hundred odd thousand dead, um, why? do we believe we lost a generation? And I think there are two reasons for that. Uh, first of all, we simply were not accustomed to casualties on that scale. The Napoleonic Wars, uh, 70,000 killed over 22 years, all regular soldiers or sailors far away from home. The most recent war, the Boer War, again, 22,000 killed, um, about half from disease and accident. Again, mainly regular soldiers, some yeomanry, some militia units, uh, volunteer units did go abroad, but essentially it was the regular army, regular soldiers. And then along comes the First World War. And for the first time, we've got these 
huge casualties, 700 and 2,000 uh, altogether. We weren't accustomed to it. Now, if you again go back to the Napoleonic Wars, uh, 70,000 British killed over 22 years, the same period the French and their allies lost 3 million. Now, I'm not suggesting that they, the, the Europeans uh, are blase about casualties, of course they're not, but their wars were an awful lot more bloody uh, than ours were. So I think the first reason is we, we simply weren't accustomed to casualties of that nature. And I think the second reason that we think we lost a generation when uh, patently we didn't um, was the way in which we recruited our infantry. Now, as you know, uh, Britain eschewed conscription. Um, both sides had tried conscription in the English civil wars, it hadn't worked. They stopped it, never did it again. Conscription in the UK would have been regarded as the most appalling implication, imp, imposition on freeborn Englishmen. It would not have been accepted. Um, so there was no inherent military understanding, inherent military ability in the population as a whole. Uh, there was the regular army and there was a the territorial force. And of course, both had to be expanded enormously if Britain was to have any influence at all on the Western Front. And as I've said, uh, we were second to the French, but, but nevertheless, our army had to expand. We couldn't just stay there with, with four divisions. Um, so what do we do? Well, young men uh, wanted to do their patriotic duty. Young Brits wanted to join, but the army was rather an alien beast. Uh, you know, nice girls didn't go out with soldiers. And, and if I join, what will they give me to eat? Where will they put me? Who will I be mixing with? Will, will I understand what they're saying? Um, there was a desire to join, but a, but, but a worry about what the army would be like. And, and the British government uh, said, join together and you serve together. And this led to the phenomenon of what was known as the PALS battalions. Now, the PALS battalions were battalions uh, raised for the war, battalions of regular regiments, uh, but from people from a very small area. Um, the county councils raised regiments, sports clubs raised regiments. Um, Lord Leverhulme raised two battalions from his own employees at Port Sunlight, and they became known as the PALS. So you had the Bradford PALS, uh, you got the Barnsley Sportsman. Um, the same applied, of course, to the Territorial Force. Uh, which was a part-time reserve force, um, again, recruited locally. So you had the Edinburgh Railwaymen, which was composed entirely of employees of the Edinburgh Railway. Uh, you had the post office rifles, uh, raised entirely from um, <clears throat> employees of the, um, the London post office. Um, the second in command was actually a banker in Hong Kong, so it took him a bit of time to turn up. He did turn up uh, in the end. Now, the way of doing that, uh, recruiting people from a very small area, they all knew each other. They'd all been to the same school. They all went out with each other's sisters. They all drank in the same pubs. They all supported the same football team. And that was terrific for what we today call peer bonding. But the downside was that when they went to war and took casualties, um, and let's say 10% casualties, which, and I don't want to sound brutal, but 10% casualties would be acceptable. Um, not if you're one of them, obviously, but those casualties all happened at the same time and they all happened in the same little template, the same couple of streets, the same factory, the same uh, form of employment. And the result was that everybody in that area knows somebody uh, who's lost a father or a brother or a husband or a son. If you'd taken the same amount of deaths and you'd spread them over the country, chronologically and geographically, same number of deaths, but considerably less um, trauma, really less uh, toxic. And if we just look again at some statistics, um, and let's look at the percentage of people killed in the local regiment. In the First World War, Leeds, 44% of the men killed from Leeds were in the West Yorkshire Regiment. Now, of course, they weren't all in the same battalion of the West Yorkshire Regiment, but brigades tended to have the four battalions from the same regiment very, very often. 44%. Um, in the Second World War, only 5% of the men from Leeds who were killed were in the local regiment. 
Bradford, 33% on the First World War, only 5% on the Second World War. Barnsley, 56% in the York and Lancashire Regiment of the First World War, only 6% in the York and Lancs in the Second World War. Durham City, 50% in the First World War, and surprisingly, 25% in the Second World War. There was obviously deep attachment to the Durham Light Infantry. Um, you'll remember in the in 58 to 60, those great amalgamations of, of regiments, when all the light infantry regiments, Durham Light Infantry, King's Shropshire Light Infantry, Duke Cornwall's Light Infantry, um, King's Own Yorkshire Light Infantry, were all amalgamated into one big regiment, the Light Infantry. And there was a lot of chuntering from Durham. And people said, oh, well, they'd still join. You know, Durham Light Infantry gone, but they'll, they'll still join. Actually, they didn't. And um, when I was doing some research for my book, I was up in Dublin going through their, uh, in, uh, Durham rather, going through their archives. And an old boy who hadn't served in the First World War, he wasn't that old, but he was fairly old. He was a volunteer. He came up to me and said, are you from the army? And I said, well, well yes, but what I'm doing is, is nothing to do with the army. I, I was still serving at the time. And he said, well, you know, all those battalions we raised in the First World War. And I said, yes. He said, we never got paid. Can you make sure we get paid? And I don't know what the hell he was talking about. Um, and the form was that recruiting or raising these battalions uh, was farmed out, if you like, to sort of quangos. So town councils, parish councils, sports clubs, as I've said, uh, employers. And they would raise the battalion. Obviously, uniforms and weapons would be provided by the war office. <coughs> and when they were regarded as being efficient, i.e. inspected by the war office, they would be then taken on strength. Um, and the people who raised them, the council or whoever, um, were refunded the expense of, of raising them and accommodating them. And obviously this, uh, according to this old boy, hadn't happened in Durham. I said I was terribly sorry, but it, I was probably unable to get um, the, the, the money refunded. So there we are. So Durham slightly odd, 25% on the Second World War. Kings Liverpool, 46% in the First War, 5% in the Second. Canterbury, 40% of the First World War, 19 in the second. Now, I've taken these cities at random. You could take any any cities in the United Kingdom and you'll find the figures are, are much the same. Now, of course, uh, in the Second World War, you also had the Royal Air Force, uh, which you didn't have in the First World War right up until April 1918. Uh, but nevertheless, we had perhaps learnt our lesson. And it's quite interesting. Uh, when you look at the 6th Green Howards, which were a territorial force battalion uh, raised in Middlesbrough. And in the Second World War, the Battle of Christo, which was on the 11th of June, 1944, they ran up against the 12th SS Panzers. And they took in a one day battle, 250 casualties, uh, 72 of them were killed, uh, the rest were wounded. The battalion effectively is written off. And if you go to Middlesbrough and you look at the various war memorials, and you look at that particular date, there aren't that many names on it. So how does one balance that? We, we know they had a huge casualty rate. I mean, um, nearly half the battalion written off, and yet they're not on the war memorials in Middlesbrough. And you, you then go and look at the muster rolls uh, of that battalion, and you find there are people from all over the place. There are Scotsmen, there are Irishmen, um, there are Londoners. There are three Americans. Now, <clears throat> what three Americans were doing in the Sixth Green Hearts, I have no idea. But the point is that although the battalions and the regiments still had their territorial connections, they didn't necessarily fill their ranks with men from that area. Um, so, so that that to, up to a point explains uh, my next my next point because I said earlier on that casualties on the Somme uh, were or casualties in Normandy were as bad as they were on the Somme. Now, if we look at this, uh, let's take the Somme. That lasted for 20 weeks and one day. There were 53 divisions engaged, 95,000 total dead, 89 per division per week. Now let's then look at Normandy. Uh, 6th of June, 1944, when the Operation Overlord, the landings in Normandy take place. And it goes on until the 25th of August at the end of the Battle of Falaise. And that lasts for 11 weeks and four days. 19 British and Canadian divisions engaged. Now, in some cases, there were independent brigades. I've put those together so that the figures are, are comparable. Total dead, 22,000. <clears> dead per division per week, 
100. So if Haig was a butcher, which I don't think he was, then Montgomery is a worth butcher. And I don't think he was a butcher either. So why do we not think that Normandy was a terrible disaster? Uh, people think the Somme was a terrible disaster. I don't think it was, but people do think that. Um, why didn't they think Normandy's a disaster? Well, I think probably there are a number of reasons. First of all, as I've just said, battalions were not solely composed of people from one fairly small area. So the deaths weren't as traumatic as they were in the First World War. Secondly, I suppose by Normandy, we probably thought we were going to win. Uh, we thought we were going to win an awful lot faster than we actually did. But at least people could see that the war was progressing to our advantage, which is not necessarily the case uh, at the Battle of the Somme. Now, I appreciate you can prove anything uh, by statistics, but I think it's, it's an interesting uh, comparison. So what effect then uh, did the casualties, the deaths of the First World War have on the nation? Um, well, if you take those who are killed, clearly they're affected because they're dead, uh, plus those that were given lump sums for wounds and wound pensions after the war. And if you add on to those, the people that the British Legion said in the 30s uh, should have a pension, even if they hadn't, largely psychiatric cases, then 3% of the total population of the United Kingdom are affected, either because they're dead uh, or they're wounded, which is 19% of men of military age. Well, 19% of men of military age is a lot, but there's still 81% um, of men of military age who are still there and able to carry on. It is true that the death rate amongst the better universities and the public schools is higher by about 1% than it is uh, of other ranks. <coughs> But it's not significant, it's not sufficient uh, to, to back up the assertion that some people make that, oh, well, the things were terrible after the war because all the leaders were dead. No, they weren't. Uh, most of them were actually uh, still, still there. Um, of course, I say men affected uh, by wounds. Um, it's very difficult to actually work out how much they would have been affected. I mean, after all, if you're a politician with one leg, you can lie equally well with one leg or, or two. Um, whereas if you're a professional pole vaulter, then probably missing a leg would, would make a difference. So again, it's, it's difficult to break those, those down. But 19% of men of military age were certainly affected by the war. 81% are still there. And at this point, somebody always puts their hand up and says, my great uncle James got a double first in Oxford and he was killed on the song and he would have been prime minister. Well, there were nine British prime ministers who either did serve in the First World War or could have served in the First World War and didn't for one reason or another. But in the same period that these nine prime ministers were serving, there were 531 executions for murder in the United Kingdom. So Great Uncle James is much more likely to be a serial killer than he is to be prime minister. And I'm aware that actuarially and statistically that argument is, is nonsense. I mean, we simply don't know what Great Uncle James would have got up to if, he, if he'd survived. So I would submit respectfully that despite the awful casualties in the First World War, and I don't mean in any way to be blasey or to dismiss them, uh, they, they were terrible. Um, we did not lose a generation and the effect on the United Kingdom was considerably less than it was on our main ally across the channel, uh, the French. Let's look at another belief. Um, British soldiers spent four years in the trenches being shot at and shelled, um, eating awful food if they got any at all, uh, <clears throat> while the rats gnawed on the bodies of their dead comrades. And the general view, I think, is that Tommy joins the army in a fit of patriotic enthusiasm in 1914. He marches all the way up to the front line and he sits there in a hole in the ground for, for four years. Well, the facts are that the British army spent more time playing football than it did fighting the Germans. Battalions spent a maximum of seven days a month at the front and the average soldier spent three days a month 
in the firing line. And I read something like 500 war diaries to come up with that statistic. Of course, there are exceptions. Uh, the Indian Army battalions tended to spend longer in the firing line because an Indian battalion was 250 men less than a British battalion. British battalion was 1,000. Um, Indian battalion was 750, but an Indian battalion was expected to hold the same length of front. So, so there, there were an exception, and there are other exceptions, but in general, that is, that is what happened. Uh, why is that? How did it happen? Well, it happens because the British constantly rotate. Staff officers and adjutants spent hours with cold towel round head, bottle of whiskey to hand, working out, trying to make sure that everybody got the same amount of time in this firing line, the support line, the reserve, back in training and so on, constantly being turned over. Um, <clears throat> now that meant that if you're a soldier and you're in the front line, you're in the firing line, it's Tuesday, it's raining, you're being shelled, your breakfast hasn't appeared because the support line, up, the support trench up which the fatigue party is bringing your breakfast has collapsed. But you know that on Thursday, you'll be back in popper ring with a hot shower, change of uniform, plate of egg and chips, and with any luck, a crack of the little mamzelle who lives around the corner. So you could always see the light at the end of the tunnel. Now, that is not what the French did. The French put a division in the line and they left it there until what was called used up in their uh, terminology. Used up meant 30% casualties. Then they would relieve them. The division that the Germans attacked at Verdun in February 1916 had been there for 18 months and they hadn't done very much in that 18 months. So if you're a French soldier and there's a light at the end of the tunnel, it's probably a train and it's going to run over you. Uh, the Germans had a sort of in-between system. They, they, didn't, they did rotate, but nothing like as often as the British. And I have always thought, always been convinced that the reason Britain is the only player where morale does not break down on the Western Front is because of this rotation. Soldiers could see that however terrible it is now, uh, I've only got to survive a couple of days and it'll be an awful lot more easy. Uh, so I think that was very, very important. The French used to laugh at the British. They said, why are you bothering doing this? This is nonsense. If you didn't do this, you could have a lot more troops in the line. Well, that is quite true, but how, how would their morale have, have stood up? So I'm quite sure that's part of the reason why British morale uh, holds up. Um, let's take another belief. Gas. Thousands of young men were gassed, drowning in their own bodily fluids or permanently blinded. And we've all seen paintings and we've seen photographs of lines of men, bandage over their eyes, hand on the shoulder of the man in front, uh, shuffling, shuffling along. Or well, what's the truth? Well, the truth is that the Brit British lost more men on the Western Front to road accidents than they did to gas. And blindness from all causes, not just gas, accounted for 0.12% of all war pensions. So that sort of rather argues against the idea that this was some terrible thing that, that killed thousands and, and thousands of people. Um, there was no warning of gas. It was first used by the Germans in the Second Battle of Ypres uh, in April 1915, when they brought up 6,000 cylinders full of chlorine. They waited until the wind was blowing away from them and they opened the cylinders and this great cloud of gas went rolling across no man's land and it fell on the 45th <coughs> Algerian division, the colonial French division, which had only just arrived from North Africa. And they'd been put into the line in the Ypres salient because that was that period, the Ypres salient was actually pretty quiet. And the idea was to give them time to adjust to Europe, adjust to European warfare. Nobody had told them about gas. There was no uh, training to deal with it. Nobody knew about it. There was no... Uh, uh, nothing um, issued that could prevent it, and they broke, and they ran, and you can't possibly blame them. And back in Ypres, the British were rushing around, pulling out Storm and Clarks. Anybody could hold a rifle, 
uh, to, to try and close the gap. Now, fortunately, the Germans were just as surprised as everybody else. They had no idea that this experimental use of gas would be so successful. And they fortunately did not have the reserve troops available to really capitalize on this gap that had been driven uh, through their lines. The, um, the next day, uh, the Daily Mail uh, in England, uh, things don't change, said disgraceful gas attack, 50,000 gassed, 10,000 dead. Well, let's just pause for a moment. Where did they get the 50,000 from? Uh, an Algerian division uh, was, was about 12,000 strong, it wasn't 50,000. 10,000 dead. Well, how many were dead? Um, Fritz Haber, the great German chemist, he was up there to observe this, to see what would happen. And he reckoned <clears throat> that it killed about 160 people. And that included prisoners who died later in the prisoner of war camp. The French thought it killed about 40. Uh, now, of course, uh, the German figure is more likely to be accurate uh, because, of course, they were able to count people who dived into bunkers. Now, the people who dived into bunkers, chlorine being heavier than air, uh, they tended to, to snuff it. Um, and the other people who were, were killed, tended to be killed, were the wounded who were on stretchers lying outside the trenches. And of course, they couldn't run away. Um, so we all remember this figure of, of 10,000 dead, 50,000 gassed. Uh, the British then made a great fuss and they said, this is absolutely disgraceful. It is contrary to the Hague Convention. It is not cricket, forgetting that actually the Germans don't play cricket. Contrary to the Hague Convention. And the Germans said, no, 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 no. The Hague Convention says you may not use artillery to deliver a noxious subject, uh, substance. We're not using artillery. Uh, we're using cylinders. And the British said, this is a semantics. The British then opened a factory in Wembley and they started to manufacture gas themselves. But they were quite clever, the British. They said, well, they've used chlorine, so we can now use chlorine, and we did in, in the Battle of Luce in September 1915. What might they use next? Well, they'd probably use phosgene, which was a nastier form of gas. So we'll make some phosgene, but we won't use it until the Germans do. That's what they did. What might they use next? Mustard gas. And that was a nasty one. Right. We will make mustard gas, but we won't use it until they do. And in the whole of the war, whole of the Western Front, rather, the British launch twice as many gas attacks as do the Germans. And bear in mind, the Germans are holding the whole of the front. British are only holding their particular sector. Now, once people knew what it was, and could devise respirators and protection against it, then it's not anymore a battle-winning weapon. It's an impugnance. Uh, those of you who have had to do exercises in nuclear, biological, and chemical conditions wearing your noddy suit will know how jolly uncomfortable. Um, you know, it sweats up, it's difficult to hear, it's difficult to be heard. Um, I won't go into how, the difficulty of bodily functions, um, but I mean, the whole thing is, is, is most uncomfortable, but it keeps you alive. And so it did in the First World War. Once you got your respirator on, you were fine. And every soldier carried a respirator. And when there was a gas alarm, on it went. Now, if you were caught with your respirator, or you didn't get it on in time, then the SOP, the standing operating procedure, was that you took your first field dressing, that was a bandage that everybody held in a thigh pocket, you dipped it in water and you tied it round your, your head. Because gas could certainly make your eyes water. And if you were subjected to enough concentration of it for long enough, it could blind you. Usually it was temporary blindness, but in some cases permanent. So the pictures you see of men shuffling along with a bandage around their eyes, they have not been blinded. They have simply done what they're told to do, tied a bandage around their ears, and they're being led out to, to a safe area. The famous painting that you see, <clears throat> I don't think any um, situation ever looked like that. You wouldn't have men lying around with nobody doing anything about it. <clears throat> so it's not a war-winning weapon. It's not even a battle-winning weapon. But the Germans get the flack for being the first people to use it. 
whereas the British get whatever military advantage there might have been, which actually wasn't very much. Now, I haven't got time to go into the differences between the British respirator and the German respirator. British respirator is much, much better because the Royal Navy is blockading Germany and they can't import rubber. Um, the British methods of delivering it, things like the Levens projector, which is a sort of battery of mortars, was much, much better than anything the Germans ever produced. And it's interesting that in 1935, the army council say to the government, British army council, British government, we understand you're going to sign uh, a codicil to the Geneva Convention, which has overtaken the Hague Convention, saying that chemical weapons will not be used in another war. We would rather you didn't sign this, please, because if there is another European war, and we think there might well be, this remembers two years after Hitler has um, been voted into power in, in Germany, we think there will be, and we want to be able to use chemical weapons because we're the world's expert at it. Now, as we know, the British government told them to get back in a box, did sign it, and gas was not used in the Second World War. The Italians used it in Ethiopia before the war. That was, that was separate. Um, I've often wondered why the Germans didn't use it on the Eastern Front, and I think probably the answer is that if they had, either the British would have given the Russians the means of retaliation, or the British might have used it themselves, <clears throat> or possibly the Russians had already, um, uh, we know that the Russians currently have chemical warfare capability, they may well have built it up there. But in the event, um, it, it was never used, and, and uh, thank God it, it wasn't. Um, but of course, we remember these tales of huge casualties. Um, part of the reason the Daily Mail said that was they, they would have known jolly well what the real figures were, but they want to make the Germans appear more beastly. And therefore you get these exaggerated figures. That's what people remember. They don't actually remember the, the facts. Uh, let's um, look at another one. I, I love this one. Um, British generals spent the war in comfortable chateaus, miles behind the lines, while their men attacked machine guns and barbed wire past the port, the men have got their ground sheets. Well, if that is so, how is it that 97 British generals were killed during this war and another 146 were wounded or captured? And they weren't killed by cirrhosis of the liver or falling off their barstools, they were killed by the Germans. Um, if you take the Battle of Loos in September 1915, two-week battle, um, six divisions going into the attack and three in reserve, so a total of nine divisions, each division commanded by a major general, three of those major generals, three of the nine, were killed. Um, a bit worrying because all three of them were members of my club, actually, the naval and military, the in and out, however. Um, and they were Thompson, Capper, Tiesiger, and Wing, all three of them. Um, Thompson Capper is a particularly interesting one because his leading brigade was, was held up and he galloped forward on his horse and said to the brigade commander, what's happening? And the brigade commander said, lead battalion's held up. Um, he gallops along to the battalion headquarters, gets off his horse, says, what's happening? Commanding officer says, my lead company's held up. They can't get forward. Um, Thompson Capper <coughs> strides up a hastily dug communication trench, waving his swagger stick with his hat and his red band on. Uh, says to the company commander, what's going on? Follow me. Jumps out of the trench and of course he's killed. Um, the company take the objective. I mean, they followed him out of curiosity, I think. Um, now, what is a general doing to be killed by the enemy? He shouldn't be. Um, I think in the, in the Second World War, I think there were three um, divisional commanders killed in actual war. One was on a, on a ship that was hit by a kamikaze rocket. Um, that's not the place but but that's not the point the point i'm making is that these men were not shirking the action um people said well i never saw haig um haig when he became uh, commander-in-chief um in the end of um, 1915 each morning he would work plan look at reports every afternoon he would visit a unit um initially on his horse and later on on the staff car but if he visited every unit, every battalion, every regiment of, of cavalry, every administrative unit, every gunner battery, 
um, he would have taken him something like eight years to get round them all. And he didn't have eight years. The war didn't last that long. Um, brigade commanders would be round the trenches every day. Uh, divisional commanders would probably see each unit uh, at least once a week. So these chaps were getting out. Now, the question of chateaus, yes, of course, they were based in chateaus because they had to be somewhere with communications. They had to be able to communicate forward to all the units under their command and backwards to, the, to their, their commanding units. And they couldn't do that from the front trench. They had to be somewhere where there was room for staff to work maps, planning, and all the rest of it, and communications. The communications then were very largely telephone. So yes, of course, they were in chateaus. But that didn't mean that they didn't get out and about and, and know uh, what, was, what was going on, because of course, they, they certainly did. Um, one is not suggesting that there weren't mistakes. Yes, of course, there were mistakes made. The, 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 the learning curve or the learning stepladder was incredibly steep. Um, at all levels, I mean, a chap would be a Lance Corporal in 1914 would be the RSM a year later. Um, a man who was commanding a company uh, in 1914 might well be commanding a brigade two years later. Um, I think the record was, was Butler, who was a Lieutenant Colonel commanding a battalion in 1914, <clears throat> commanding 800 men. And in 1918, he is a Lieutenant General commanding 100,000 men. So, of course, there were mistakes made. The wonder is that there weren't actually all that many and they tended not to be repeated. That's that's the wonder, not, not that there were mistakes made. Of course there were. Um, let's look at another um, belief, atrocities. There's, there's a lovely book uh, called The Daily Mail Official Book of German Atrocities, which was published sometime in the late 1915. Lovely book if you get hold of it. And it's got uh, accounts of the, um, the Germans roasting Belgian babies on the end of their bayonets. Why? Why would they? They were, they were perfectly uh, well rationed in, in 1914. They weren't shoving food. Cutting the breasts of nuns. Why would you do that? I mean, the, the German army was disciplined. Um, German officers were gentlemen. They didn't behave like that. Uh, it's true that they burnt down the library at Louvain in Belgium, which contained a number of very valuable first edition books. I'm assured by a German historian, I have no reason to doubt him, was that that was not deliberate vandalism. It was some idiot kicked over a cooking stove and that sent the whole, the whole thing uh, on fire. But the atrocity that the British know about or claim to know about most is the question of Edith Cavell. And the belief is that um, this young British nurse was foully murdered by the Germans in Brussels in 1915. And it got her eventually a state funeral in St Paul's Cathedral, two statues, one in Norwich and one on the road going up to Foyles. Um, and got her buried just outside the walls of Norwich Cathedral. And the cry, remember Edith Cavell, ran round the world. It did wonders for the postcard industry and had considerable effect in the neutral countries. And of course, in the only neutral country um, that mattered, the, the United States. But what's the truth? Well, the truth is that Edith Cavell was a nurse. She was 51 years of age and she was a teaching nurse in a hospital in Brussels. She was training Belgian nurses. And when the Germans invaded in 1914, the invasion happened so quickly that an awful lot of people were left on the wrong side of the line, both civilians and soldiers, including Edith Cavell. And Edith Cavell got involved with a sort of rescue organization which smuggled British and French and Belgian soldiers that had been left on the wrong side of the line uh, back either into neutral Holland or back into Belgium or into France. And she was caught. And she was tried perfectly lawfully under a thing called war treason, which is part of the laws of armed combat that everybody had signed up to, the Germans, the British, the French, everybody else. And war treason said that if you assist the enemy and you are not wearing uniform, then that is an offence and the 
maximum penalty is death. So she was tried, the transcript survives, perfectly reasonably by a German court. She actually pleaded guilty. She was found guilty and she was executed in a firing range outside Brussels. Now, perfectly legal, but if there had been a public relations advisor to the German high command in 1914, they'd have said, for heaven's sake, don't shoot her. Lock her up, don't shoot her. Because by doing that, it was an appalling um, public relations disaster for the Germans and a real propaganda coup uh, for the British. So Edith Cavell, patriot she certainly was, uh, martyr she wasn't. She was perfectly legally tried uh, and dealt with. One of the abiding beliefs held by large portion of the public is the question of military discipline. And they will tell you that young men, shell-shocked by the horrors of war, unable to stand it anymore, were hauled out before kangaroo courts and shot out of hand. What are the facts? Well, the facts are that 90% of those sentenced to death had their sentence commuted to imprisonment or suspended. Now, military law had something that civil, civilian law didn't have for another 40 years. It had the ability to suspend a sentence. And that meant you were charged with an offense, you were found guilty, you were sentenced, but it's suspended, which means that you go back to your unit and you carry on as normal. And as long as you behave yourself, that's that. If you then misbehave again, then that previous sentence can now be <coughs> brought in, can now be implemented. 346 men were shot. 37 of them were for murder. Now in civilian life in the United Kingdom, if you committed murder, the death penalty, you, you were hanged. Of those 346, another 40 were already under suspended sentences of death. Now, Alsop himself, and I may say, of course, there was no distinction between the grave marker for a man who was killed um, perfectly honorably fighting the Germans uh, and a man who was shot by a firing squad as a criminal. There was, there was no difference. And initially, the next of kin were not told to spare them. That changed when they discovered that people would go home on leave and say, ah, your son was a coward, he ran away or whatever. So they then decided they would tell the next of kin and they did. This chap also, uh, and I've just taken him really at random. August, 1916, he went absent without leave. Now, without getting into the, the details of military law, <clears throat> the difference between absent without leave and desertion. If a man goes down to the bazaar has too much to drink, falls asleep in the gutter, and he's not on parade next morning. He is absent without leave, and he is dealt with by his commanding officer. If he is found in Boulogne, in civilian clothes, riding a bicycle with a string of onions around his chest, having thrown away his pay book and burnt his uniform, that's desertion. And the difference is that a deserter does not intend to return. So if you charge somebody with desertion, you have to prove that he did not intend to return. The fact that he's burnt his paper and thrown away his uniform and is pretending to be a Frenchman would be pretty solid evidence that he didn't intend to return. So that's, that's the difference. Um, now, when he deserted in November, 1916, they were not under orders for the front. So his court-martial found him guilty of desertion and he was sentenced to detention. Now, you didn't actually put people in detention for very long, because if you did, you are giving him what he deserted to get. In other words, he's got away from the, the action, he's got away from the fighting. Uh, so he's brought back into his unit, and in February 1917, he deserts again, and he's got marshaled again, and again he's sentenced to death. This time, it's suspended. And in April, I mean, he doesn't learn this boy. In April, he deserts again and again is brought before a court martial and is sentenced to death. And on this occasion, on the 15th of June, 1917, he is actually shot. Now you cannot say that the army didn't give a man a second chance. Um, as for the executions in the, in the Great War, 291 British, 
25 Canadians, five New Zealanders, four West Indians, <clears throat> and 21 civilians. The civilians are nearly all members of the Chinese Labour Corps. Now, the Chinese Labour Corps, who were subject to military law, uh, they are there to carry out fatigue duties behind the lines, road building, uh, cutting down trees for timber, uh, and all that sort of thing. And they had an unfortunate propensity to murder each other, uh, usually for gambling debts. So that's, that's who they are. Now, it's often said, and I keep hearing it, Australians couldn't be shot. Yes, they could. Australian military law was exactly the same as British military law, and 113 Australians were actually sentenced to death. But whereas all the other Dominion and colonial authorities had abrogated to the commander in chief the right to um, confirm or otherwise a death sentence, so that's French from Hague on the Western Front, uh, Maud in, in uh, Mesopotamia and the rest. Australia had not. Australia had reserved it to the Governor General of Australia. And the Governor General, Sir Ronald Monroe Ferguson, who was, who was a Brit, who was a Scotsman, wasn't actually in Australia, would not confirm a death sentence. Uh, and in each case, uh, he either suspended uh, or uh, commuted to, to imprisonment. And the result was that Australian discipline out of the line was not good. I mean, in the line, they were cracking good soldiers out of the line. Um, I think statistically, I worked out that you were eight times more likely to be in jail if you were an Australian soldier than you were a, a British soldier. Um, and, and Monash, the Australian Corps commander, several times went to Hague and saying, look, discipline in such and such a unit is bad. I've got to shoot a few. And Hague would say, talk to your governor general. Um, the Australians actually learned from that. And uh, in the Second World War, Australian discipline out of the line was much, much better. They were always very, very good in the line, but a um, bit of a nuisance uh, out of the line. Um, what were death sentences actually um, carried out for? Well, casting away arms, you throw away your weapon, clearly you can't fight, uh, that's an offence. Sleeping on sentry, two. Now, people often say, well, heaven's sake, the chap has been working all day. He's had no sleep. He's probably missed a couple of meals. He goes on sentry. He cannot stay awake and he goes to sleep. Why should he be shot? After all, a security guard in a factory would get a written warning, might even get the sack, certainly wouldn't be executed. Now, the reason for that, the reason why the army took and takes uh, sleeping on sentry <clears throat> very, very seriously is because the sentry is the eyes and ears of everybody else. The rest of his comrades down the bottom of the trench, they're asleep, they're writing home, they're having a meal, cleaning their weapons, whatever. And if the enemy approach, the sentry has got to be able to warn them and rouse them. And that's why the army takes it very, very seriously. That said, officers were very reluctant to catch their men asleep. I mean, I, if I was inspecting my sentries, I would always shuffle my feet, <coughs> cough or whatever. Um, in fact, Gurkhas, thank God, don't go to sleep on sentry. Um, but these two actually were in um, Mesopotamia and, and they had really pushed their luck. They, the pair of them, two, um, had gone off. They got themselves a, an armful of straw from the horse lines, um, found a nice tree, bedded down and went to sleep. So really they were, they were taking the mech in a big way and they were shot. And after that, they... Um, number of cases of chaps feeling drowsy on sentry um, dried up. Mutiny, that is the most serious of military offences. It is a willful defiance of lawful authority. It's a collective offence. One man cannot mutiny. It's got to be two or more. Um, three men were, were executed for mutiny. Disobeying a lawful command, if you are told to do something, and you disobey it, then clearly in war, that's pretty serious. You have to give the man time to disobey. If I say to a soldier, um, parade in front of me at midnight in drill order, and he says, no, I bloody well won't, you can piss off. Uh, I cannot do him for disobeying a lawful command. I'll do him for something else. Um, I would have to wait until midnight, and when he failed to turn up, then do him for disobeying a lawful command. Striking or using violence to a superior, well, clearly, uh, if... Um, under active service conditions, the chap thumps the company's arm major. Uh, he can't be allowed to get away with that. Six executed for that. Quitting a post, if you are told 
you are to stay there. And if anybody comes around that tree, shoot them. You then decide that actually you're going to leave and you push off. Then clearly that is a serious offence. Cowardice is the difficult one. 18 people executed for cowardice. Now, every other offence under military law is objective. You either threw away your weapon or you didn't. You were either asleep or you weren't. You either thumped the company some age or you didn't. Um, but cowardice is subjective. What one person might think was cowardice, another might think was just carelessness. And that is why in the Manual of Military Law of 1914, which explained each offence, it's about a paragraph to each offence. Very straightforward. Cowardice is a couple of pages. And it ends up saying the behaviour reported must be seen by the average soldier as cowardice. So the average soldier must think it was cowardice. Now that means it was very, very, really, very difficult to prove. And they tended to go for something else, quitting a post um, or, or something like that, rather than cowardice, because it was so difficult to, to define. Murder, 37, well, I've already said, <clears throat> if you committed murder in civilian life, you'd be hanged. Desertion, this is the big one, 266. Now, clearly, you cannot allow people in the middle of a war to suddenly decide they're going to go home. Uh, and desertion carried out the death penalty. Now, of those 346, 91 of them were under suspended sentences of one sort or another. 40 were under suspended sentences of death. And nine were under two suspended sentences of death. Now, in 1998, um, the year I left the army, I don't think the two are connected, the death penalty in military law was abolished. I think that was a mistake, not because I want to shoot my soldiers, of course I don't. But if we have another war, go over the top and you might be shot, run away and you will be, is pretty persuasive. Go over the top and you might be shot, run away and you'll be put in jail and there'll probably be an amnesty at the end of the war. Doesn't have quite the same force behind it. Uh, and while I'd be very reluctant to have any of my soldiers shot, um, I think to have the sanction there might be important, particularly, and I don't want to be rude about civilians, uh, but particularly if you have a mass army, uh, it's not just the regular army, you've got mass army possibly conscripted as well. That's only my opinion, and you can throw, well, you can't throw bread rolls at me because I'm talking to you on a webinar. Um, as you know, uh, military offences, there was a blanket pardon for military offences uh, some years ago, uh, which seemed to me to be wrong. If you're going to pardon people who were executed, why, why not pardon people who were punished in other ways? Um, why not pardon me for my two days of restricted privileges when I had one penny overdrawn at the Academy Bank when I was a Santos cadet? Nobody's pardoned me for that. But that's, um, that's only my opinion. Well, there are lots of other things we could talk about, um, but you haven't got three weeks to listen to it. Um, we could talk about the cavalry, you know, these government sponsored polo clubs. Actually, the cavalry, although the great cavalry charge to Berlin never happened, nevertheless, the cavalry were jolly useful. Um, there were lots of little actions uh, when they were very, very useful. The um, battle at High Wood uh, on the second phase of the Somme, the 14th of July, cavalry, Indian cavalry did exceedingly well there. Lots of instances during the, um, the Kaiserschlacht in 1918, where the cavalry were able to hold the line. Um, the fastest way across country was, was on a horse. And remember that the British cavalry, unlike the German or the French cavalry, British cavalry were actually mounted infantry. They had the same rifle as the infantry, which wasn't the case with the French and the Germans. Uh, they went for me to be on their horses, uh, got off and, and fought as infantry. So we could look at that. The soft underbelly, you know, this, this constant trying by people like Lord George and Churchill uh, to look for the, for the soft option. Um, why are we fighting on the Western Front? Why don't we go in through Salonika? Um, Lord George's constant cry that um, you knock away the props and Germany will collapse. Props, they meant um, Austria, Hungary, Bulgaria, and Turkey. Uh, missing the point entirely that 
Germany was was the prop. The reason Bulgaria, Austria, Hungary, and Czechia were able to stay in the war was because of German training and German money and German equipment. Um, we could talk about political interference, the appalling way in which uh, Haig particularly, but other generals too, uh, were treated by their political masters. Uh, I mean, no, no commander in chief of the field should ever have to put up with what Haig had to put up with uh, from, from uh, Lloyd George. But I, I would repeat, this was a unique war. We were a coalition. Um, and I know that um, if I was talking to the general public, that an hour from me uh, wouldn't convince them. But I would say to them, look at the evidence. When, when you hear these great statements, say, well, where did you learn that? What, what actually happened? Look at the evidence. Don't be taken in by politicians' memoirs. Uh, Lloyd George's memoirs, um, his, his memoir of the, Second, of the First World War, is the most appalling um, litany of apologia um, that I, I've ever read, I think. It's almost as bad as Montgomery's uh, memoirs, but that's another subject. Uh, the War Poets. Um, if you're a poet, you want to say something that'll, that'll sell. Um, and decent men trying to do their best in a war which nobody expected or nobody trained for, um, it doesn't really sell papers, doesn't sell books, whereas butchers and bunglers uh, certainly does. Um, a great deal of the population take their thoughts of the First World War on Blackadder. Now, Blackadder, wonderful, very funny, terrific um, text, terrific music, but it's, it's, uh, it's as true... It's as truthful as Winnie the Pooh. And I'm sorry to have to tell you, Winnie the Pooh is fiction. Oh, what a lovely war. Um, that, that play and then a film. Again, wonderful play, wonderful film. But the chap who wrote the script, the playwright, said this was one part me and seven parts Joe Stalin. It was a great victory in 1918. You had a tiny British army that had to be expanded 25 times and had to be trained, deployed and equipped until in 1918, it was the only army capable of defeating the Germans on the field of battle. And they did defeat the Germans on the field of battle, not the French, not the Americans. Yes, there were mistakes. The wonder is that there were so few and they weren't often repeated. Of course, there were casualties. You cannot win a war without them. That's the price you pay for having a small, regular army. And if there's another great war, there'll be another Somme, there'll be another Normandy until the army gets the message, gets trained, gets ready to go and, and can do the business. There was great pride in 1918, and I think there should be great pride now. But thank you very much indeed for listening to me. Gordon, thanks very much indeed. That was splendid. Thoroughly enjoyed that. And if we can raise our hands in the virtual round of applause that we do in these circumstances, uh, I can tell you, Gordon, that there's hundreds and hundreds of hands going up uh, all, all the time. So thanks ever so much for that, that wonderful presentation. It's now time for Q&A's questions, everybody. So um, we've got a number of questions already, but I'm going to, in the first instance, just invite Sebastian Mills to, to um, step forward um, and um, unmute yourself, Sebastian, and, and start your, your video. Yeah, my next door neighbour in Switzerland was one Alan Clark, who um, I always thought was an acquired taste and one I never terribly acquired myself. But he was very amusing. And the story is that in his diaries that he, he was Minister for Defence Procurement, I think in the late 80s. And he lobbied Maggie to be made Minister of Defence. And her answer was, Alan, the army won't buy it. They haven't forgiven you for the donkeys. Have you heard that? Yes. Um... I think actually politics is the poorer without Clark. I mean, yeah. he was disgraceful. If there was gold medals for being a bounder, he'd have, he'd have <laughs> loads of them. Uh, but and, and his diaries are, are wonderful reading. Um, yeah, uh, there was a. He, he said that he said that General Hoffman, who was the German army's expert on defence, 
had said that the British uh, were lions led by donkeys. And some old, uh, and some old academic, and I can't remember who it was now, but I was told, uh, was researching the Hoffman papers prior to writing a book about Hoffman. And he, um, he couldn't find this anywhere. <laughs> Uh, and, in, and in fact, the only thing he could find in the Hoffman papers where Hoffman said anything about the British was that he was actually quite complimentary about the British. So he went along to see Clark, apparently, and sort of tugged him on the, on the sleeve and said, excuse me, Mr. Clark, you know, your point about lands read by donkeys. Um, I've been through the Hoffman papers and I can't find that anywhere. Where, where did he actually say that? And Clark said, oh, I made it up. Now, of course, it was said during the Crimean War by a French general that the British were lions led by donkeys. Also actually unfairly, because although all we remember about the Crimean War is the Charles the Light Brigade, uh, in fact, um, the British didn't do too badly. And the, the British army didn't do too badly in the Crimea. The people who were, the reason there were so many cock-ups was because the commissariat didn't work. And that was that was something that was under the control of the government, not of the army. But no, um, Clark, <laughs> I said, yeah, Clark was an absolute bugger, absolute frightful chap. But, but I, I think, um, you know, as long as you realise he was a bugger, I think he was quite amusing. Would you term him as a cad or a bounder or both? Oh, both. Oh, unquestionably. And I think the, 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 the judge, the judge's wife and daughter, I think. <laughs> Probably the most amusing scandal that he got. Showed some, showed some style, didn't it? <laughs> I've just Thanks been, very much. I really enjoyed that. Just been brought a gin and tonic by the staff. Okay. Fantastic. <laughs> Cheers. Thanks for that, Sebastian. Um, Richard Crompton. Okay, right. I, I'll ask Richard's question for him. Richard, stand, doesn't matter. Right. Um, it was probably it ties in with the, with our uh, chat in, in um, the outset. Um, why did you write Poppycock and how did you do your research, uh, was Richard's question. Uh, well, the reason I wrote it was that, um, well, it goes right back to when I was a small boy. And um, in the upper sixth mathematics class, um, the headmaster was a mathematician, he was a Cambridge mathematician. Um, and he realised that actually there were only six of us in upper sixth maths. Um, two of us were hoping to go to Sandhurst, one was hoping to go to the Navy. Um, one was genuinely hoping to go to Cambridge. Nobody else did. And he knew jolly well we weren't that interested in mathematics, but um, my A-levels are in maths because I was good at it. And um, he had been in the First World War. He'd served in the infantry, been an officer. Um, and he'd rather enjoyed his war. And we always used to try and get him off, you know, quadratic equations or whatever it was, onto the First World War. Um, and he was very interesting because he would, he, yes, he would tell lots of funny stories, but he'd also say, look, this is what it was like. And as I sort of got, grew up and got older and talked to some of my sort of grandfather's generation who'd been in the war, uh, I thought this, this just what they're telling me doesn't gel with what I'm hearing about idiots and fools and unnecessary war and, you know, months and months and months and mud up to your armpits and all that sort of stuff. Um, so when I decided that um, a professional tour with a professional career with horses when I left the army uh, was going to lead to bankruptcy and those history might be a better bet. Um, one of the things I wanted to do was to try and look at this question of how the public saw the First World War. And I thought, you know, everything I've heard and read doesn't doesn't gel. Let, let's let's take these beliefs and let's look at the look at the evidence. So the evidence. Um, obviously, I talked to as many um, veterans as I could, um, and and there were still quite a few, um, not that many, but there were still some who had all the marbles. Um, I can remember talking to an old boy uh, who was a Chelsea pensioner uh, about the question of gas, and he said I was gassed. Gas on the song, ruined my life, he said. Ruined my life, lighting another wood by it. And I said, what age are you, sir? 92, he said, ruined my life. Um, I read a lot of uh, letters that people were kind enough to show me, letters that people had written home. And I spent a lot of time in the National Archives read, looking at uh, war diaries, um, which are the nearest we can get to a primary source, uh, you know, because mostly they were written at the time or, or shortly afterwards. Um, the 
the, the army produced, the war office produced <coughs> at the end of the war, uh, statistics of the, um, uh, the, the, the efforts of the, of the British Empire, which is, I don't know if you can see it, it's way up there, um, which is a huge volume. And that, that is full of statistics. Um, it takes a bit of time to weed through them because uh, they're not always presented in the easiest way, but it's a very useful bit. It, it gives you the recruiting figures. Uh, it gives you the disciplinary figures, gives you the casualty figures in great detail, gives you the number of men recruited from each area, from each of the colonies, each of the dominions and whatnot. Um, so I suppose it took me uh, about three years to do the reset because of course I was, I started doing it while I was serving. Um, so I couldn't, you know, do it full time. Uh, and then when I left, um, I wrote like two books before before that one. But I'd always intended to write that because I, I felt that the army was being dumbed down, uh, that, that actually the army had done pretty well in the First World War and that people should recognize that. John Terrain had a big influence. And I think John Terrain, who I have tremendous respect for, he possibly went too far, you know, in that, in that everything was, was perfect. Everything wasn't perfect. There were mistakes. Um, but but I didn't think there were that many. So that's that's why I wrote it because I felt very strongly uh, on the subject. Um, I'm delighted to say that it, much to my surprise, I didn't expect to write a bestseller. Uh, you know, you don't expect history to be a bestseller. It it became a bestseller in military history. Um, you know, not like not like a novel where you know if you don't sell a million you failed, uh, but and it's still selling actually. I'm still getting a check every every six months. Um, I don't think there's much in it I'd revise. There's probably one or two things I'd, I'd perhaps um, twitch slightly, but I, I stand by it. An important thing is that every statement I've made, I made damn sure that I could back it up with the evidence because there are loads of people. Um, you know, what I call the whinging tendency, who love to say, well, you're wrong. Of course, the, there was generals were stupid. And of course, they all died of gas or whatever. So I made jolly sure that, you know, and I checked it again and again and again to make sure that I was absolutely fireproof um, from, from, from any challenge. Um, so that's why I wrote it. I, said, I, I mean, I thought I thoroughly enjoyed writing. Actually, I said, love writing because you have a dinner party, you can bore 10 people. You write a book, you can bore thousands. Wonderful. Fantastic. Thanks, Gordon. Thanks for that. Uh, I'm sorry, Richard, couldn't ask his question in person, but thanks for answering Richard's question there. Elizabeth Hardy. Elizabeth, do you want to just unmute yourself there? What do you think the motivation was behind uh, English literature in the 1960s, the, GC the GCEs were on the war poets, which was where people people of my generation certainly got the idea that everybody had been gassed and the numbers were enormous. Yeah, uh, you're, you're absolutely right uh, with that. And in fact, even more recently, um, I came across a, a, a teacher who, and I heard him say this, telling his, um, his pupils, uh, standing in a cemetery in France, uh, that note how few officers there were because they were all behind the lines having good dinners failing to point out that actually there are rather less officers than there are soldiers, but there we go. Um, I think the 60s were a time, now I missed out on it, uh, on this great sort of hippie period and, and you know, sex, drugs and rock and roll, unfortunately, uh, not unfortunately, um, I, I, joined, I joined the army in 1960, so I missed it all. But I think it was a period where authority was challenged um, I think it was a period where we'd come out of the restrictions of war, of, of wartime, you know, rationing. And, all, and after all, rationing went on until the, the mid 50s. Um, and suddenly people were starting to make a bit more money. People were starting to feel a bit more comfortable. The, the, and, and, and they started to challenge things. And, and one of the things they challenged was the conduct of the First World War. Of course, that had started way back. I mean, the, the, the criticism started really in the, I suppose, in the 30s. Uh, or even the late 20s, when the, the land fit for heroes promised by the politicians didn't actually happen. Um, and the government uh, was pretty shoddy in some ways in its treatment of uh, wounded ex-servicemen. If you remember, Haig refused to accept a title until the government brought in pensions for, for 
wounded exiles. Uh, but I think the 60s were that sort of period. You know, it had hippies, it had the Beatles, it had, um, you know, all that sort of business. Um, and that included um, criticizing what went before. Um, I mean, I suppose today the equivalent is, is uh, decrying the empire, which I think was a force for good, by and large, was a force for good in the world. Um, well, in the 60s, it was sort of sniping at authority, you know, whether it was the Church of England or it was the army in the First World War or whatever. Less criticism of the army in the Second World War, I think, because the cause was obviously just, you know, where the cause wasn't necessarily obviously just to the man on the street of the First World War. Uh, you know, I mean, the Kaiser wasn't a monster. I mean, he was pretty stupid, but but uh, he wasn't a monster. Um, whereas in the Second World War, you know, people could say, oh, no, this was just war. Oh, yeah. Uh, so much less criticism. Although the performance of the British Army in the Second World War is far worse than the performance of the First World War. If you look at them purely, purely military point of view, uh, read my book on the Second World War, which um, I, I also get death threats for. Uh, sorry, I've got off the subject. Uh, I think the 60s were just that sort of period. And that's why the war poets, and of course they're great poets. I mean, they're wonderful. Um, they're, they're just, <laughs> I think they, they are not correct. I mean, people like um, Graves, you know, who, who threw away his um, military cross, he caused great offense in his battalion, which was still uh, back in, in, uh, in France. Um, the reason Sassoon was put in a lunatic asylum was not because the British government were terrified of what he might say. The reason he was in a lunatic asylum is because he was a lunatic. He was as mad as a box of frogs. <laughs> you know, but, but, but I think that's, that's um, you know, it was, it was a period for, you know, challenge, criticism. And, and, and that's and, and you're quite right. I mean, that's that's uh, that's what, what the curricula were in those days. Thanks for that, Gordon. Thanks for answering Elizabeth's question. Thanks for your question, Elizabeth. Patrick, you're next, um, but I, I don't think you've got a video there. But if you can just unmute yourself, you have done. Uh, Patrick, away you go. Oh, thank you so much, and thank you for a very interesting speech. <laughs> I my question is about. We're being told, I mean, from historians and other academicians to uh, popular and also to journalists and songwriters and what have you about how the British soldier, the British Tommy had no idea for the causes uh, which were, uh, for which he were fighting, that he was completely unaware and they said, uh, we're here because we're here. Uh, and uh, that they were completely unaware and just, should we say, victims of an uncaring establishment. Would you say well, there's any truth to that statement, claim? I, I think that that is certainly claimed. I, I don't think there's any truth in it, because if you read the letters that soldiers, private soldiers sent home, um, it was quite clear that they knew what they were fighting for. In the, the British Army, particularly on the Western Front, but in the war as a whole, is made up really of the, the pre-war regular army, professional soldiers, uh, and it's their profession, and they don't necessarily care what the, the what the cause is. Uh, I mean, I was a regular soldier for 38 years, and I never cared what the cause was. Uh, well, as long as it wasn't sort of too unpleasant. Um, then you had the territorial force, who were a bit more concerned about the, the cause, and the conscripts. Um, but they certainly knew what they were fighting for. And we know that from the letters sent back. Um, as for them the being, uh, you know, poor working class lads exploited by the um, toffee-nosed chinless wonders who were their officers, which is the sort of socialist working party uh, attitude of the war. This, again, simply isn't true. And again, if you read the letters written by soldiers at the time, uh, you can see that it, it simply wasn't true. The British Army was and still is in many ways, um, it, it's very paternal. Um, you know, unlike in the French army where the officers once, they lent, led, their, led their men with great gallantry and then disappeared into the officer's club. Um, the British uh, officer regarded it as his job to look after his chaps on or off duty. So they organized football games and gymkhanas and uh, dramatic, uh, all, all sorts of things. So. The British soldier could never say that, it, that, that uh, his officer uh, neglected him. He might wish sometimes that the officer would bugger off and 
leave them alone. Um, but he certainly didn't uh, didn't think they were. And when you think about it, army on uh, you know two million men on the Western Front. Uh, if the soldiery had decided that they did not believe in what they were fighting for, no amount of court martials could have made them do it. Um, I, I sometimes say to my junior officers that um, we command our soldiers by their leave, although they have not necessarily spotted that. Um, <laughs> but but certainly, if if that was the case, I mean, look what happened to the Russian army on the Eastern Front. You know, where, where the soldiery were exploited. Um, and and you, you, you saw what happened there. But I, I just think this isn't true. I think the soldiers did know what they were fighting for. Um, they may have been fairly simplistic in their outlook. Um, they were fighting for, for their country. They were fighting for home. They were fighting for the king. Um, a lot of the letters talk about fighting for the king and, and the royal family. And when the, um, the little presents come at Christmas from various members of the royal family, uh, the soldiers were very, very appreciative of that. Um, they were less cynical, I think, in those days, uh, possibly less liable to question. Um, I think the officers certainly knew, they understood about the, the attempts of German, uh, Germany, uh, Germany trying, to, trying to control the whole of Europe. Um, soldiers didn't necessarily look at the sort of political side of it, but th th yeah, they knew what they were fighting for. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thanks, Patrick. Thank you. Robin Broadhurst. Robin. Gordon, good evening. Hello, uh, old chap. Hello. Uh, good to see you all. Uh, <laughs> first of all, a, a, a very quick thing, which I think you will recognise. Many years ago, I was doing my uh, studies under Brown Bond at King's, and one of the people he got to come and talk was Charles Carrington, before he died, obviously. And mm. somebody in the seminar said to him, um, the German army were pretty good, weren't they? And <laughs> Charles Carrington exploded. German army, I've beaten them twice, 1918 and 1944. No, they were no bloody good at all. And I've always remembered that. Of course, his great books, which are tremendous. I thought you'd like that story. Gordon, my question really is very simple. I, I, I love your book on um, the First World War and, of course, your book on the Second World War. Of course, no other regiment, as we know, apart from the Gurkhas, took part in the Second World War, according <laughs> to your volume. We, we know that. We know that's true. Um, but what do you recommend for the general reader today trying to summarize not just your views, but where we are today on, on, on the war? It is very difficult because there's a huge acres of, of books. Um, I think Gary Sheffield's book on Hague is worth reading. Uh, Gary is not a, an uncritical admirer of Haig. Um, he, he, um, he believes that Haig has been badly treated. Uh, he believes that he was a good commander. And I think his, his, his book on Haig is very balanced. Um, and I think that's, that's well worth reading. Um, oh, John Keegan's book on the First World War is very good, but again, he takes the view that, um, he takes the view that actually it was an unnecessary war. Which, which I simply could not accept. Now, John Keegan, now sadly dead, uh, was the man who um, was my military history tutor at Santos. Yeah. And in, mine, in, and mine, yeah. Um, and it was really Keegan and Chandler uh, that really got me interested in military history. Um, do not read Laffin, frankly. Laffin, Monty Bank. Um, I'd never have guessed you'd said that, Gordon. <laughs> um, and actually, going back to Carrington, I mean, the, the the reason the Germans lost the war is not because the British soldier or the American soldier or the Russian soldier was better than the Germans, because frankly, it wasn't. The reason they lose the war is you cannot take on the British Empire, the USSR, and the United States of America all at the same time. That's why they that's why they lose the war. And they um, didn't, they didn't learn the lesson. <laughs> They didn't learn the lesson. No, no, they didn't. But I think in terms of, of, I mean, you and I have both been through RCB. Where did we get that from? Sorry, for those who, who haven't um, uh, won first prize in life by being born British, uh, the regular commissions board, which is selects young men, schoolboys, to go to Santos and become officers. And in 1940, there was a real worry about the uh, caliber, the, the ability of junior officers. We were 
the, the army thought we were running out. So they said, well, what is the best army in the world? How does the best army in the world select its officers? How does the German army do it? And they copied the German system. And that is still, it's now called the Army Officer Selection Board, I suppose the regular commission board, but that's still the way they do it. And I think we have a great deal to learn from the, the German army of the, of the First World, Second World. I mean, really, since the great elector, I think they've been the best soldiers in Europe. Yes, they, they lose wars because they take on too much. That's why they lost the First World and the Second World. Um, but, but I think militarily, uh, we could learn quite a lot from them. I can't remember what the question was. <laughs> what, 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 you, anyway, you, you have answered it. <laughs> Go on and see you on Saturday. Yep, see you then. Cheers. Thanks, Robin. Thank you. Anthony Davis. Oh, hello there, Gordon. Thank you. Really enjoyable. My question is about General Sir John French. He never seemed to get a good press, even from the beginning at the retreat from Mons. He was he was miles away. He never coordinated his corps commanders. And then again on the retreat from the Marne, he, he wanted a refit instead of fighting. And then again, of course, at Loose, uh, he held on to the reserves and Hay didn't like that. But was he as incompetent as, as what it seems? I think the trouble with John French was he was a, a, a highly competent cavalry commander in South Africa. I mean, he did exceedingly well there. And I suppose in a way it was the... Is it the Peter principle where you get promoted one level above your competence? Um, I think being effectively sacked as, as um, CIGS probably didn't do him any good. As you know, he, um, he'd he made promises uh, to those, to the, the so-called Kara mutiny people uh, without the authority of the cabinet. Um, I think he was, he was overweight. Uh, I think he was, he was mentally, I think he was tired. I think he just wasn't sufficiently robust uh, to lead an army in the most intensive war the British had ever ever fought. Um, he was, I think, over the top. Uh, and I think it was as well that he was removed. Uh, and as you know, it was failing to release the reserves in time <clears throat> that, that really did for him, although they didn't actually sack him until December. Um, I, he wasn't. A, he he didn't like the French, which doesn't help if they're your main enemy, um, uh, your main ally. Sorry, <laughs> French are our traditional enemies, but sometimes we fight with them. Um, he didn't like the French. Uh, he kept saying he thought they were unhygienic and dirty, which they probably were. But it's not a good I mean, if you've got to fight with them. Uh, he didn't speak French. Uh, Haig, of course, did speak French, and Haig knew the importance of getting on with difficult allies, <clears throat> whereas I think French didn't. Um, I think his incompetence is in some ways exaggerated, um, but unfortunately, uh, there are no black, you know, everything's either black or white, unfortunately, in this in the field we're in, there are no sort of greys. And I think French was, was a grey. <laughs> uh, I think excellent, <clears throat> really competent chap, uh, right up in the early 1900s, but by, by 1914, he was he was a busted plush, I think. There was a story when he was talking to Lanzarek, and I think the question was, what, what are we going to do, he asked Lanzarek, and Lanzarek said, well, we're going to go fishing, because they, they didn't communicate. Mm. As you say, John French didn't know French. No, he didn't. Um, no, it, it's... Um, I mean, if you if you want to be a great British commander at any any era, whether it's um, Marlborough getting on with the Dutch or whether it's Wellington getting on with the Spanish or whatever, you, we have decided that we will fight our wars with professional armies. A professional army is expensive, therefore it's small, therefore you're going to fight in a coalition. Therefore, you have to be able to operate in a coalition, you have to be able to get on with your allies, however difficult they may be. And French couldn't get on with the French, whereas Haig could. Um, Montgomery's biggest weakness in the Second War is that he couldn't get on with his allies. He didn't understand the importance of working in a coalition. Um, something that Marlborough did, Wellington did, and, and Haig did. And French didn't, couldn't, didn't want to, I suspect. That's a truism all over, isn't it? It's how you get on with people. Yeah, yeah. Thank yeah. you very much, Gordon. Thanks, thanks Anthony, for your question there, thanks. Uh, last question for this evening, because it's, uh, it's gone half nine now, so uh, we'll uh, just take Michael Phipps's uh, question. Michael, just unmute yourself. Thanks. Thanks, David. 
Gordon, that was brilliant, entertaining and informative, which is always uh, tricky. So fantastic, thank you. Um, I just wondered if the the perception that's now held by the British public of the Great War is that the same perception that's held by the rest of the empire that fought in the war and the, the public in that area that you know the the families and the and the friends of the Gurkhas and um, and the Indians. Um. In India, it's regarded as, uh, certainly by the Indian Army, who of course have retained all the First World War battle honours, um, it's certainly regarded as a, a, as a just war. And the, the Indian Army thinks that it did pretty well in both, both wars, actually. Um, Canada, Canadian, my grandfather's in the Canadian Army and, and, and was most entertaining on the whole subject of the uselessness of the Ross rifle, for one thing. Um, Canada, they're really only interested in, in what the Canadians did. Um, I, I've lectured in Canada and, and they said, by the way, we're not really interested in anything else. Just, just tell us about what the Canadians did. Um, I don't think there's the same abhorrence of the war because, of course, they didn't have the, the same casualties in proportion to their population. Uh, unless, of course, you were in... Um, Newfoundland, which which did have, but they were a separate, as you know, a separate colony then, weren't part of Canada. Um, Australia, they will harp on on Gallipoli, and I keep saying to them, "Why do you hold up Gallipoli? You didn't know what the hell you were doing in Gallipoli. You're bloody useless. Not your fault. You're inexperienced, and untrained. You got out of control after the landings. Why don't you concentrate on the Somme, where you did know what you were doing, and in fact you did jolly well." And they sort of mutter and chunter and go away. Um, they also, of course, blame the British for all the things that went wrong in Gallipoli, which is slightly unfair. Um, that wonderful film, which is bloody well done, Gallipoli, um, which cost threepence or something. And all the filming was done in Australia, except for the bit in Egypt. And you'll remember that I think it's um, the attack on the neck, I think, um, where the, the brigadier with a very plummy accent is saying, no, my dear chap, you must keep going, keep going. And everybody thinks that he's a Brit. He's not. He's an Australian. And he is wearing Australian collar dates. And when I took this up with the Australians, I said, oh, well, well that's, how, that's how Australian officers talked in those days. I'm not sure that they did. I think even their officers probably had an Australian accent. Um, so they, they concentrate on... on um, Gallipoli. The, to the French, um, I think the effect of the First World War is still with the French, you know. I think the, their dismal performance in the Second War was very largely because of what had happened to them in the First. And they make a big thing of oh, the 11th of November. They have it on the 11th, not we have it on the Sunday nearest. And every little village, as you know, going around France, there's the war memorial and the names. I mean, they, they suffered far less than, than we did. So to them, it's it's mournful. Um, it's taken them a long time to get over the feeling that Germany is the constant enemy. Um, I think to them, it's they think of the First World War as something that's all sad. Um, I don't think they regard it as being useless or unnecessary. I think, that's, I think it's only in UK where you get this constant um, uh, you know, vituperative, um, pejorative articles and speeches, speeches and whatnot. Uh, you know, I got very annoyed with um, Nutty Slack, as we used to call him, Hague, not 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 Field Marshal Hague, H A U G E, um, who was a leader of the Conservative Party at one time, when he said in the House of Commons that he'd noted that um, the minister was behaving like Hague moving his drinks cabin at one foot nearer to Berlin. And I thought, well, Jesus Christ, you're the fucking foreign, excuse me. You are the foreign secretary. How wrong can you get? But I mean, I think historical opinion has changed. Actually, I think, I think military historians, historians uh, by and large would now come round to the, to nearer to the terrain view than the, than the Laffin view. But I think the public, I, I'm not sure the public will ever be convinced actually. I mean, I've had three death threats for, for things that I've said about the First World War or written about the First World War. Um, people just don't like their um, 
I mean, I remember saying somewhere that um, I'd read all the transcripts of the First World War court martials, the, the, the ones where people were shot. Uh, I was able to find them all except one was missing and there's nothing, uh, there's nothing suspicious about that. I mean, if you've got millions of documents in the TNA of Bada Bissam missing. And I'd said uh, that having read them, um, I'd expected to find rough justice because after all it was a rough war. And I was pleasantly surprised to find that the courts had leant over backwards to avoid uh, delivering a death penalty. Uh, of course, the court was composed of men who'd themselves been in the trenches. They knew the pressures that, that they accused were, were under. Um, I discovered that in all cases, except for a couple of cases in 1914, when the, the soldier under military law could, could select any officer he liked to defend them. And if the officer is available, he has to do it. From 1915 onwards, the defending officer had to be legally qualified, either a solicitor or a barrister. And there was a, a, a solicitor or barrister at every corps headquarters who would look through the trial, make sure the rules of evidence were followed and all the rest of it. Um, and I said, I couldn't find a case that I wouldn't shoot now, never mind 1418. In comes another death threat, usually written in green ink, block letters, bits underlined. <laughs> Um, the fact that I'm still here would indicate that actually they're not very effective assassins. <laughs> they all go in my flat earth file. And when I'm feeling miserable, I take it out and have a read of it. <laughs> Sorry, I don't know what the question was. I... It's all right, God. <laughs> I think you've um, talked around the answer there. M Michael, thanks very much indeed for, for your question. That, that's tremendous. Ladies and gentlemen, um, it's been a thoroughly enjoyable um, evening uh, with Gordon and if we'd like to just show our appreciation in the usual way by once again raising our hands in the um, virtual in, 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 as, as the virtual uh, round of applause that would be tremendous and um, I'll just um, leave it there well right uh, so Gordon um, that was a, a, a super superlative uh, presentation um, and for everybody who's um, uh, not yet booked, please do book on for the future webinars that we've got lined up. Uh, we've got them every Monday and every second Thursday through March, and then we'll probably um, just phase them out slightly in April with a, with a view to uh, uh, being released from, from the lockdown that we are in. And uh, I think in April, we've got them just on every single Monday. So, um, if you haven't done so already, please do register for the next one. And Gordon, just from me personally, I'd just like to say thank you very much for your work uh, tonight and uh, for the super presentation. Thanks very much. Thank you very much. It's always a joy to talk to a, an, an educated audience. Uh, thanks very much for, for, for listening and see you soon, I hope. No worries. And uh, to everybody who's uh, watching this, uh, please do stay safe and hope that you'll join us at, uh, for the future webinars. Thanks very much and good night. Mademoiselle from Armentier's Parlez-vous.